Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kali. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kali, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kali. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. I'm your host, Sakar Kavle. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Amy Vaughn with Bootstrap Legal. Welcome to the show, uh, Amy. I appreciate you taking time today. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Uh, so Amy is uh, the founder and CEO with Bootstrap Legal. Uh, their company is a niche uh, company which does a lot of uh, syndication paperwork and uh, law around it. Uh, they have a proprietary framework where they are, do- uh, you know, framing the documents through their proprietary software as well. And she's also a partner at SOS Now and Associates. She is the host of the Law and Blockchain podcast, and she has authored several articles into Bloomberg uh, Law and also the Practice Guide to ICOs and uh, LexisNexis. Um, she also has a LLM from uh, London School of Economics and the JD MBA from the University of Southern California. So, oh boy, it's uh, quite quite a background, <laughs> Amy. Uh, thank you for taking time. Uh, give us some background, Amy, as to how kind of your career shaped up, and now you are such a uh, sort of famous into uh, oh, doing gosh. all the, the syndication <laughs> and SFC paperwork for real estate uh, syndications. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think my career path has been, you know, nothing short of interesting. It's it certainly took a while for me to to find my niche, but I think the one or the, you know the couple threads that have kind of um, shaped my career are one. I'm just really into practicality and efficiency, and two, I like helping people grow their businesses. So. Um, you know, I graduated in the middle of the last recession. Now I have to say the last recession, right? Sure. Now we're, we're in a new one. <laughs> no, we're, we're uh, in a new one. You're right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was, I was graduating from London School of Economics at the time. And so I ended up just across the pond in um, D.C. working for the federal government, um, you know, and did international trade policy for the federal government. So it was through Department of Commerce, Department of Transportation. I also did a brief stint at State Department where we looked at business and human rights. And I thought I would um, end up there for the rest of my career and work my way up to being, you know, a uh, U.S. trade representative and all that stuff. But I met my husband who matched for his medical residency in LA, which Mm -hmm. is where I'm originally from. So I ended up you know, moving back out to LA and um, suddenly had to start out completely from scratch because there really is not a lot of international trade policy work out on the West Coast or just, you sure. know, mm-hmm. in, in general outside of um, DC. So I ended up becoming general counsel of, you know, the first crop of real estate crowdfunding platforms at the time. Mm-hmm. And that was when, you know, the Jobs Act had just passed and Rule 506 c just became a new thing. So it was a really interesting time because we, we were, you know, I, I got to be one of the first attorneys actually putting out real deals under 506 c mm-hmm. which, you know, it's, it's an art. You, sure. you, you have to, um, there's a lot that goes into marketing one of those deals. Um, and, you know, after a couple of years there, I left and worked at a uh, boutique firm that just specialized in real estate syndication. And while I was at that firm, um, I noticed that we only ever represented, you know, larger deals. And mm-hmm. one of my uh, friends that I met through one of the real estate conferences, who is now a syndicator, he 
his first deal, he came to me and he was like, Hey, I want to raise $300,000 for this, um, deal. And I thought, okay. And I told him, Hey, uh, I'm, I'm happy to represent you. I would tell you the price. And then if you don't use me, I'm not going to be offended. So I told him the price and surely enough, he did not use me. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is really interesting because the law applies to everyone, not just people doing big deals, but sure. people doing small deals don't have the, um, it's really difficult for them to comply with securities laws sure. mm -hmm. because of the sheer transactional cost. So I left and because I have a bit of a tech background, I um, threw together some some document automation technology that uh, would allow me to work faster and smarter and, you know, go ahead and uh, automate the first draft of real estate syndication documents for people. And that's, that's bootstrap legal. That's what we do. Awesome. Awesome. So for a layman person, like perhaps who may not have heard of, uh, you know, like what is exactly a syndication? How does it work? And give us some, uh, just, a, just a quick framework around it and what, what exactly it is. Yeah. So a syndication is just a very fancy word for a group offering. And if you read the definition of what is a security, right? Essentially, it's a group offering. Um, if, you, if you truly go into the definition, it's like, oh, you are taking money from someone and money can be cash, it can be cryptocurrency, it can be um, sweat equity, right? Mm -hmm. You're promising them some sort of return on investment mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're taking it from you know, a, a group of people, what we call an, a common enterprise. So that's really what it is. If you're trying to get people to invest in something, they might make or lose money and there's you know, many people involved, then you're pretty much selling a security. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, there is an entire governmental agency called the SEC or the Securities and Exchange Commission mm -hmm. that um, regulates the sale of securities. And there's many different types of securities, right? So the types of securities that real estate syndicators often sell are, are what we call private placements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can contrast that with public security. So public is, you know, stuff that's listed on the stock exchange. It's, you know, stuff on NASDAQ or the Dow or whatever. Whereas private securities means it's not listed anywhere. It's not public. Mm -hmm. It's privately done between people who know each other and it's not very liquid. Sure, sure. Now, now we are at that threshold, Amy, that we are speaking about it. Give us, give us those types of, you know, the 506B or the C that we keep talking about. Uh, let's, sure. let's go there. Yeah. So basically, whenever you are selling a security, you have to either be registered or exempt from registration, right? Mm -hmm. So if you register, that's like the big public companies. If you want to be exempt from registration, then there's a number of different exemptions you can use. So the most popular um, exemption is what we call 506B, B for boy. And, you know, just so you have a bit of context, there is more money raised every year under private securities than in the public markets. And Really? Wow. Ninety five percent or more of that money is raised under five six B. I see. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because five six B is so easy to use, right? Mm -hmm. You can have a couple of non accredited, which means non rich people, although most of them should be accredited. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can raise as much as you want. Um, and then you don't even have to go to the SEC for permission in the beginning. You, um, you, oh, you can, you can basically go raise the money and then do all the notice filings where you give notice to the government afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to ask for permission. Right. Um, mm -hmm. There are some other ones that are um, also popular. So just very quickly, they would be 506C as in cat. 
Sure. Um, the big difference between 506C and the one I just mentioned is that you can go and publicly advertise. Under 506B, mm -hmm. you really need to stick with your existing network of family and friends, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. And because the SEC is giving you that additional ability to advertise, they want to make sure you're not ripping off grandma and her last social security check. So they are going to require you to make sure that all your investors are accredited mm -hmm. um, so that if the money is lost, it, it really isn't grandma and her last social security check. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, another one that is increasing in popularity is Regulation A+. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we call mini IPO. You can raise, right now you can raise up to $50 million. Um, and you can raise it from a public, the public, so non-accredited investors. However, you know, um, it, it's, one of those, it's one of those exemptions where you need to ask the SEC for permission beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, we call that qualification, and that is a minimum four to six month process. So it's much more burdensome. And you'll mm -hmm. have to do ongoing disclosures and things like that. And then on the opposite spectrum, um, you know, whereas Regulation A plus is, you know, for pretty heavy duty people, mm -hmm. there's also what we call Reg CF or regulation crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Currently, you can raise up to a million dollars in change every 12 calendar months. Um, I'll caveat all that, and, and you can raise it from non-accredited investors, but I'll caveat all that by saying that currently there is, um, uh, we're in the process or, you know, the, the, SEC is in the process of soliciting comments from people um, on the Federal Register for a proposal mm -hmm. to raise the cap for Regulation A plus from 50 million to 75 million, and the cap for Reg CF from 1 million to 5 million. So when that happens, um, that should I think significantly change the ball game for people, because you know previously no one in real estate really wanted to use Reg CF because like. You know, you can burn through one million so quickly, and it's not like you can do it for different deals. You know, they sure, tie sure. it back to the individual. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can do five million per calendar year, that's a lot more leeway. Sure, that will signif significantly help. Uh, I mean, a large part of the syndicators, you know, doing you know, like mid-sized deals uh, under five million raise. I guess you know. Now, speaking of uh, you know different types of investors and you know, the like what sort of education that uh, should be there, Amy, what are your thoughts? Because like, for example, you know, we have syndicators who probably do not know anything, right? And then you have accredited or perhaps, you know, mid-size that we call the sophisticated investor class and things like that. Could you maybe throw some light on the importance of, you know, like sort of their, um, uh, you know, qualifications and also like what sort of uh, education that they should have to kind of invest into these kind of uh, private placements and indications? Sure. Well, you know, what I will say to start off with is people should never invest money that they can't lose. Um, and they have to invest knowing that they could risk losing all of their money. That's in every single PPM I have ever seen sure. in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just the underlying fundamental, right? Sure. So if we start from there, then it goes, well, you know, how much should you know? And, you know, I, I really think that comes down to your, level, your personal level of risk. I personally think, you know, you should understand the numbers in the deal and it should make sense to you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, whenever people invest in a single asset syndication, which means you've already, the sponsor has already identified the property, they had the property under contract. There's really two things that they're looking at. One is the underlying property and do the numbers in the business plan make sense? And then mm -hmm. two, they're looking at the sponsor. Does the sponsor have a track record? Are they trustworthy, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. When you're investing in blind pool, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the sponsor has a business plan you know, they say, give me money now. And then I'm going to execute according to this business plan. Like, Hey, I want to buy up 100 unit apartment buildings in the Midwest that are value add. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there is, there are no properties to underwrite. So really you are investing in the sponsor and 
you have to trust them. Right. Um, mm. You know, you should definitely look at track records, right? You, sh I, I personally have always liked investing pe in people who, you know, uh, know what they're doing from a numbers perspective, sure. but will also tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't invest, right? right because right. they're they're upfront. Um, you know, if it sounds too good to be too true, it, it usually be is. careful, <laughs> right? Right, right. <laughs> no, I think transparency, integrity, and of course the track record are, I mean, paramount. That you want to make sure that they have done these things before they exactly understand everything. You know, as we all know, like you know, finding the deal is one thing, but I guess once you close on it, that's when your experience, your track record, your ability to execute your business plan, all of that you know, starts to get so real that that is perhaps, uh, you know, execution is what I think separates a lot of folks from, you know, wannabes and things like that. So that totally, I mean, what you said, uh, you, you know, completely agree with you there. Uh, now, uh, Amy, moving on, uh, your firm focuses on uh, doing some of the automations and trying to, you know, optimize some of the cost and also be beneficial to a lot of beginning syndicators and things like that. Uh, could you maybe talk about some of the benefits of your firm and how it is uh, sort of appealing to a lot more, uh, you know, like sort of the uh, syndicators who may be getting started? Yeah. So, you know, like I was saying, I, I didn't really see a viable option for beginning syndicators or people who were doing small deals. They had to either choose a huge transactional cost, which mm -hmm. from a business perspective doesn't make sense, sure. or mm -hmm. they had to choose to violate securities laws, which doesn't really help you sleep very well at night. <laughs> so I <laughs> didn't think that was a very good choice. Um, and so, like I said, we, we use document automation technology but, you know, I wouldn't say it's like, you know, oh, we use a template and it fills in your address. I think it's much more complicated than that. There, there's a lot of logic in there. We've coded over 800 different variables. And the result of this is for the client, they don't really see a big difference in, you know, how they interact with an attorney. But on our side, at least for the first draft, we're able to cut out um, many hours, um, at least for the first draft, mm -hmm. there's still always an attorney involved. Um, I don't think you can get rid of the attorney because, you know, you, you need them for guidance and counseling and decision-making and, you know, an attorney will still always go, th there's, there's always going to be bespoke elements of a deal that frankly, it's not worth coding into the software because it only pops up once in a while. So we still manually draft all of that. But I think the result for the client is it's cheaper, it's faster. And, you know, I actually, one of, the, one of the, my other real estate syndication attorney friends told me that we're actually the fastest in the industry. Um, when we finish intake and when the client says go, and we start drafting, we actually turn around drafts within three business days. Um, wow. mm -hmm. It may take longer for that to get the final document set because the client sure. has to review it. Um, sometimes there's changes, but you know, it allows us to work really quickly. And you know, when you have something under contract where you have to close in 30, 45, 60 days, um, time is of the essence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I was just going to ask you about that as well, Amy, is that what, at what step, uh, we should engage your firm, meaning, you know, the investor is looking at several deals, you know, some pan out, some don't, you are, you know, obviously, uh, you know, submitting a lot more LOIs, the letter of intents, right? And let's say, you, you know, you, your uh, LOI is now accepted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, going through your due diligence and the contract phase and things like that. Uh, when is the optimal time for the, uh, you know, for the sponsors to engage your firm? So I will say that a couple of years ago, I used to tell people, oh, you know, let us know when you're submitting an LOI, just so we can get prepared to onboard you. Mm -hmm. But it's like so competitive nowadays that now I just tell people, hey, when, when your LOI is accepted mm -hmm. and you're about to go into contract, then engage us, right? Sure. Because, you know, um, you could submit 10 LOIs and 
none of them could get accepted, right? Sure, sure. Um, but, you know, I, we work relatively quickly. And mm -hmm. as long as the sponsor works quickly, I mean, we, we have done deals from soup to nuts before, including entity formation, mm -hmm. in as little as, you know, one week. I That's see. unusual. Sure. Mm -hmm. That was also because the sponsor turned things out around very quickly, but, but it's been done for. The only thing I will say though is, um, as far as entity formation, uh, right now because of COVID nineteen, different states are doing different things, and not every like you know when we form your entity for you, mm -hmm. it used to be that you could pay an additional fee and get expedited service within you know sure. twenty four hours mm -hmm. and. For example, right now, California does not allow expedited service. Um, mm -hmm. And so I have a client who um, has been waiting two weeks to get their entity form because they only have regular service. So keep that in mind. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like even if we can work fast on our side, right now the states are backed up because of COVID-19. I see. I see. Now, uh, speaking of entity formation, uh, Amy, um, how typically is the uh, sort of a syndication uh, sort of framework structured? Like, can you give us an idea of, uh, you know, like the private investors, the active investor sponsors, and then you have the uh, property holding uh, LLC as well. How all of that puzzle is structured from an entity standpoint? Yeah, sure. So it's pretty simple. The most fundamental structure is a two LLC structure. Mm -hmm. One LLC is what we call the holding company. That is the company that, you know, that's the LLC that takes title to the property. And it's the LLC that investors invest into and they hold, um, you know, units or an ownership interest in that entity. Mm -hmm. Now that entity is managed by a second LLC called the management entity or the mm -hmm. manager. Mm -hmm. And that's usually where the sponsor sits. Right. And so typically if it's, you know, if the ownership split is like an 80, 20 split um, between investors and the sponsor, then that means the management company uh, probably has a 20% ownership interest in the holding company. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. I see. Got it. Got it. Um, now, speaking of, uh, you know, the private investors, right? Uh, folks who are listening to this uh, podcast who probably haven't had, uh, you know, much background into it. What some of the keys you can tell them that what is the right uh, sort of returns or what other things they can look at uh, when they're looking at a deal? Uh, you know, what some of the metrics they can look at from, you know, what, what can you advise us about that? Sure. So first of all, I'll say that there is no standard um, return because you always have to look at the risk of the deal, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you are looking at a new construction deal, the risk is much higher, thus sure. you're going mm -hmm. to expect a higher return mm -hmm. versus if you're looking at value add multifamily mm -hmm. where, you know, there's not as much risk because you don't have to do new construction. Everything's there and you're just doing like cosmetic upgrades and you're increasing, um, you know, uh, tenancy and then you're increasing rent because you're adding some amenities. Um, that has a lower risk and thus you would want to expect a, a lower rate of return. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I can tell you what is standard as, as far as value add multifamily, sure, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So typically what we see is something like a, if there's a pref, it'll be, mm -hmm. you know, eight to 9%. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the split, it's usually something like 70, 30 or 80, 20 mm -hmm. um, with the larger portion going to investors, the smaller portion going to sponsors. Sure. Um, and, you know, maybe like a 10% deviation from that. Um, I have seen 50, 50 before, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, they, they hiked the pref up to like 16% and that was a very unusual deal. Mm -hmm. And I've, I, I've, I've seen, all sorts of things before. Sure. Um, I would say it, it also depends on what community you run in, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a very mainstream multifamily syndication community. And then there's people who, you know, operate outside of that and their investors are, are outside of that. 
I see. Got it. Thank you for that. Now, uh, Amy, a lot of times, you know, uh, sponsors are, are talking to newer invest, uh, you know, new people, bringing them on boarding and things like that. Uh, so before a uh, investor can go and uh, become part of a 506B offering, uh, again, that's a private offering that's meant for only for friends and family. Uh, and we have always heard that, yes, there is a, a for a new person uh, getting associated, there's some kind of a three-touch rule before he can be considered as like a, uh, you know, like a friend or uh, like somebody, like a close acquaintance you uh, know of and things like that. Can you maybe share uh, some sort of guidance around how that onboarding process should look like uh, and, you know, what's the what's kind of the best way for uh, to get that started? Yeah. So first of all, I'll say that the three touch rule is not actually an SEC rule. Mm -hmm. It is kind of a thing that has been made up in the real estate syndication industry as good practice, right? But it's not an actual law or rule. Mm -hmm. So what the SEC says is that you have to have a pre-existing relationship with Mm -hmm. the investor and they need to at least be sophisticated, right? And so They do not provide exact guidance on what that means, but Mm -hmm. we have some ideas from the guidance that they've put out. So Mm -hmm. what does pre-existing mean? A couple years ago, people thought pre-existing meant you needed to at least know them for 21 days before mentioning any sort of offering to them. Mm -hmm. We now know that is not the case. Um, uh, The SEC came out with a letter called Citizens VC a couple years ago, Mm -hmm. and um, they pretty much agreed that uh, the following process is okay. So what the Citizens VC company did was they said, hey, we got the investor information, their phone number, their email, and we had that, then we did something to qualify that this person actually has some sort of um, understanding of investment and um, financial stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it could be a phone call. It could be getting to fill them to fill out a financial suitability questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And that would ask information like, you know, uh, what's your risk tolerance for investment? How much did you invest last year? How much you're looking to invest this year? Um, You know, what, uh, you know, how do you know how to invest? Do you have an MBA? Do you work in the finance industry? Do you work in real estate? Have you, do you already own, you know, five single family, you know, units, you know, what give us stuff that justifies your financial suitability. So the SEC has said, Hey, that's a really great first step. And, you know, maybe if you do like a questionnaire like that and you have like a five minute conversation or something like that, that's great. Like you have a pre-existing relationship and you have made sure that they are sophisticated, right? Mm -hmm. For a 506B deal, um, all of that applies because you are, you can accept up to 35 non-accredited investors. When it comes to a 506C deal, um, all that kind of goes out the window and it's more so about is this person an accredited investor, which, Mm -hmm. you know, there's certain number of caps and certain ways to qualify as an accredited investor and you have to actually diligence that they're accredited. I see. Thank you for that uh, detailed, uh, you know, clarification there, Amy. Now, speaking of best practices, Amy, you've seen a lot of syndicators, like, you know, from beginning to sort of, you know, the uh, lesser experienced, and then you you see the, uh, you know, more successful uh, as well. Uh, Can you maybe give us some sense of uh, how, what are the hallmarks, like how successful investors uh, kind of raise the capital and what have you seen in terms of what are some of the best practices that they do that perhaps we should know about? I think the biggest thing is to keep it simple, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I get beginning syndicators and they want all this complexity, you know, they, they want various phases throughout the capital raising process. They want different types of, um, you know, different tiers of investors and all this kind of stuff, you know, you can do that. You know, it's, it's all legal. You just have to disclose it. It's just a matter of 
it, it's not a legal question of can you do it? It's a question of should you do it from a business perspective, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the simpler you make things for your investor, if you can explain um, the deal in a couple of breaths, then mm -hmm. I think you're on the right track. Sure. If it takes you more than a couple of breaths, because you have to go through multiple waterfalls and multiple phases and multiple um, tiers of investment, mm -hmm. you know, your investor is going to be very confused. And You're, if they don't right. mm -hmm. get it, they're not going to invest. They're not necessarily going to take the time to figure it sure. out. They're just going mm -hmm. to be like, I'm going to pass on this one. It's too confusing for me. Right, right. Simplicity is power is what you're saying, basically. Yeah, the, yeah. Keep it simple so, and direct and, you know, make it extremely appealable in, in a very succinct manner. And, and resist the urge to make it complex. I know it's, it's very enticing, but resist the urge. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Amy, uh, give us some best practices about uh, folks are raising money through, uh, you know, sort of retirement accounts as well. What has been your experience about, uh, you know, sort of looking at that avenue of deals uh, and, you know, what, what are some of the key points we should keep in mind if we have to kind of uh, think, think about, you know, using that route for, uh, you know, raising capital? So people can certainly use their SDIRAs to invest, right? Mm -hmm. There's a ton of SDRA providers out there. Um, just keep in mind that each SDIRA company is different. And what, if, what I've seen from the past is every SDIRA company has their own requirements for what they need to get funds wired. And that may be everything from, I need the subscription agreement um, signed in blue ink and FedExed to me <laughs> all the way to, no, I, I am serious. I've, I have had that request before, you know, mm -hmm. um, you, you want, you want the investor to call up their SDRA provider and ask exactly what they need. You know, um, a lot of times it won't even be, um, the investor's name. It will be, you know, um, in FBO. So something, something FBO for the benefit of, and sure. then the mm -hmm. investor name. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it can be complicated and it can take a while to get SDRA money wired. And so if you need it for closing, you want to prioritize those investors first because, because it's a process. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, now, Amy, you are also a host of uh, you know, the law and blockchain podcast. So I'd be curious to know some details around, um, you know, like how blockchain is affecting real estate. Can you maybe share some uh, details around that? Yeah. So um, I don't think blockchain is really affecting real estate today. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it won't do that in 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. but at least it's not happening today. And I think to the extent it does affect real estate in, uh, you know, it, real estate in the U.S. one day, um, I think many other countries will have adopted it before us. So I think, sure. you know, the mm -hmm. most compelling thing about, you know, mixing up blockchain with real estate is that you can actually have title on blockchain. And so, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to deal with these, uh, you know, inane issues of who holds title, we don't know. Oh my gosh, the county records office burned down in 1943 and we don't know who the original title holder was, all that stuff, right? Right, right. Um, yeah. so, so that's the appeal. Um, it's just that, you know, our, our title industry and our, you know, our whole... Um, system for who owns what real estate is so entrenched that I think it's going to be very difficult uh, to enable blockchain. But, you know, they, they have done experiments in the U.S. Um, Cook County did an experiment a, a couple years ago, and I, I think it was quite successful, although I don't think they're doing it anymore. Um, I, I think it'll happen in developing countries first. The second thing that people are talking about is, you know, um, STOs or security token offerings. And 
the idea is that you can go and, you know, do a real estate syndication, raise capital, Mm -hmm. and you can issue the investor a token, which represents their ownership interest in um, that project or that offering. And you can automate um, a lot of the backend code so that potentially, you, you know, today private placements are not very liquid. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to if you were to code a lot of the compliance into the smart contract for the blockchain, then potentially you can have lower transaction fees for secondary trading. Mm-hmm. and actually have liquid real estate syndication investments. I will say, however, that I think that is also um, quite far in the future. Sure, um, it will take some time to arrive, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's people who have done it, but it's just, it's very costly today. Anything that's novel is expensive. Right, right. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And um, how did that sort of podcast and what do you talk about on your podcast? uh, You know, how did that come about? Oh, well, I used to be a fellow of the uh, American Bar Association business law section. And gosh, how did that come about? I was just, you know, talking with some of their leadership one day and at that time they had never even launched a podcast, right? Attorneys Mm -hmm. love, you know, they've just gotten onto like blogs and stuff like that. So podcast was (laughs) completely new for them. Um, But I thought it, it would be fun and interesting. And it's been awesome for me because I get to go interview, you know, really top notch people um, at Mm -hmm. the intersection of law and blockchain. So, you know, I, I had an interview with, the general counsel of Coinbase, who Mm -hmm. has since left and is now like, I think, deputy assistant deputy for controller of the currency or something like that. I've interviewed the first general counsel of Ethereum, who is now like a securities commissioner for the state of Colorado. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, it's it's been really fun talking to um, smartest brains in the industry about, you know, the intersection of you know, how a blockchain affects law and vice versa. Sure, sure. Uh, great, great. Uh, I mean, it's a very interesting area and it's something that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, will increasingly have to pay attention to as to, you know, how that's shaping up. So uh, it's been great, uh, Amy. Thank you for coming on. Uh, please share with the listeners how they can, uh, you know, uh, sort of find you and learn more about your company. Sure. Um, So our website is very simple. It's just bootstraplegal.com. The associated law firm with it is Mm jobsactlawyer.com. And, you know, people can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah, I'm around. I'm just on social media. (laughs) (laughs) Great, great. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, we are always delighted to hear your advice and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, experience that you bring to the table. So it's been a, a great podcast. I appreciate your time today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest.